together. So that should be a lot of fun, I think. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're continuing on with our Characters of Christmas series, and we're concluding it today by looking at the Magi that came later. And we're going to be learning from them and figuring out some of the lessons from their lives that we can learn that kind of apply to us as well. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. After they had heard the the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Christmas has just concluded, and I'm sure that there are some of you that are already beginning to rack your brains about what the perfect gift for someone on your Christmas list might be. Because everybody has this, that person or persons in their life that are hard to buy for. If you know that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you have somebody like that on your list, because there are different things that happen. There are people in your life that if they want something, they buy it. So if they need something, they just go get it. They don't wait for Christmas or wait for holidays. They just go pick it up. Or they're the impulse shoppers that if they see it, it's theirs. And they put it in the cart and they check out. And so it's hard to keep up with that. It's hard to keep up with what they have. Then there are the other people on your Christmas list that have absolutely no hobbies or no interests, or anything that they like to do. And you know some of those people too. There isn't anything that really rings their bell. And so in order to find something for them, it takes a lot of work. And by the time you're done, you half the time you end up frustrated and disappointed, thinking, oh, I wish I could have done better. I wish I could have got something that would really they really would have liked this year. But it's a difficult thing. You look at catalogs and websites, you look at the stores and try and find just that perfect thing, just that perfect gift uh, to help them celebrate Christmas. And that's an, that's an exciting thing. It's a hard thing to do, though. The men in our story today in Matthew chapter 2, the final characters of Christmas, the Magi, they had an unenviable task. They were going to see a newborn Savior, and they were bringing gifts. Now, on paper, this seems like a difficult thing to do because, you see, no gift would ever be good enough. Like John 1 says, Jesus was with God in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and he was there in the beginning. So anything that you would give Jesus would seem like a paltry gift. It would seem like a small thing. It would seem inferior and worthless. But in verses 1 through 12 of Matthew chapter 2, we learn from the Magi that the true gift that we must gift is our best to Jesus. The true gift that we have to offer is giving the best of ourselves to Jesus Christ and everything that we do. There's some lessons that we learn. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 9. And the first lesson is we must give our attention to Jesus. We must give our attention So Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. 
But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went over ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. So the first lesson that we learn is we need to give our attention. We need to give our attention to Jesus. There are many different theories as to how the Magi knew that Jesus had arrived. Some had said that they had been in Babylon after the exile, so they were around the Jewish folks, and they had heard of all the Old Testament predictions that had been offered. There, they may also have been Eastern astrologers who had been studying the ancient manuscripts that had been passed down for generation through the nation of Israel. They may have seen it that way. Or there is some that believe that they had had a divine uh, revelation from God uh, like others had had. Like they, maybe they'd seen angels like the shepherds had. We're not exactly sure what it was that took place. We're not exactly sure how this all happened. But regardless of the events leading up to their visit to Jesus, God had their full attention. God had their full attention, and they pursued Jesus out of their desire to worship him. Tradition says that they were from Perithia, near um, ancient Babylon, which, if that being the case, if that is correct, uh, which is a lot of people ascribe to, that meant that their journey may have led them on a journey of over a thousand miles. That's a long way. I can't imagine driving a car that long. I've done it before. It's not a lot of fun. I can't imagine traveling by camel or however they came, traveling a long ways to go and see Christ. But they had, their attention was caught. Jesus had their attention, and they actively were pursuing him. They actively were seeking him out. That's what they wanted to do. The question for all of us is, does Jesus have our attention? Does Jesus have your attention? Does Jesus have my attention? Do we actively pursue Christ in everything that we do? In the lineup of things that take place, you have a long list. Each of us has a list. There's family. Okay? There's jobs, there's entertainment, there's our children, there's all sorts of other activities that we like to do. The question is, where does Jesus fall in this list of things? Where does Jesus fall in this list of things that we give our attention to? Hopefully, Jesus is right at the top. But it's easy to get the list shuffled around. And sometimes things that belong lower down the list end up finding their way up to the first or second position. And this is a difficult thing. We turn around, it doesn't take very long, we don't always do it on purpose, but the next thing we know, things are all out of order. Priorities are all out of whack. And this happens sometimes. So the question is, are we actively pursuing Christ? Are we, act, act, uh, are we every day pursuing him in everything that we do? Are we seeking to grow as followers in our pursuit of Jesus? And how are we going about doing that? Are we spending time in God's word? Are we spending time in prayer? Are we spending time in study, getting to know him and knowing him more? Are we spending time gathering together to worship? Are we spending time in Bible studies? Are we doing those kind of things? What are we doing to pursue Christ? What are we doing to pursue him and follow him and see where he is leading us and seeing where he is guiding us in our lives? You see, as Americans, we're all in the pursuit of something. For many people, the pursuit is something that maybe they shouldn't be pursuing. Not necessarily bad things, but things that might take their focus off Jesus. We might be pursuing a nicer car or a bigger house or a comfortable retirement. For some people, they're always in pursuit of that perfect relationship, that perfect person to complete their lives. The, there's a lot of things that people pursue and people look for. For many of us, there's something that's captured our attention. There's something that's captured our thoughts and our minds that we're looking forward to each day, something that we wake up and we're in pursuit of. I don't know what your thing is. I only know what my things are. What are the things that I try and pursue? And I have to ask myself the question, is the thing that I'm pursuing first Jesus Christ? Is the thing that I'm pursuing first Christ and what he's done for me? Am I pursuing him out of my love? Am I pursuing him and giving him my attention and everything that I do? And if I'm not, I need to reorganize things, reprioritize things, and put things in the right order. 
Because it's easy to do, and we don't do it on purpose all the time, but it just happens. It happens slowly over time. Our priorities become shifted and changed. So the question is, are we giving Jesus our attention? And that's the lesson that we can learn, one of the lessons we can learn from the Magi. There's a second lesson. It's found in verse 10 in the beginning of verse 11. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. As wise men <coughs> followed the star, they, they didn't stop in the place where they expected. Jerusalem was the religious center at that time, and it stopped actually in Bethlehem, which isn't what they were anticipating. And after this long journey, they were overjoyed, and they bowed down to worship. They bowed down to the one that they were coming to see. The wise men understood that what they were seeing, what they were looking at, was something that was divine, something that was special, something that was unique, amazing, and worthy of worship. Throughout history, there have been many false gods passed off as the one true God, passed off as the genuine article, the real deal, but they were not. When the wise men saw Jesus, they knew that he was the one they were seeking. He was the one that they were looking for, and they responded appropriately by worshiping him. They responded appropriately by bowing down on their knees and kneeling before him. Each of us has experienced life-changing power and salvation that comes from Jesus. We understand that our Savior deserves our worship. Philippians 2, chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. Philippians 2, chapter 9 or Philippians 2, chapter 9, verses 9 through 11, sorry. It says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee is going to bow and every knee is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise, of our adoration. Worship actually is defined as the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for deity. I looked it up. What does that mean? And that's exactly what I looked up and what I found. The question is, what is it in our lives that we revere? What things in our life do we adore and give our reverence? In this world, there are many things competing for our attention. And this requires us to pause and give focus to the one to whom all praise is due and may require us to move, remove from the throne of our life whatever it is that we have placed there. What is sitting on the throne of your heart? What is sitting on the throne of your heart today? What is that thing that's captured your imagination, captured your attention? What is it? Each of us has something that's sitting there. Hopefully for all of us, Jesus is who is living on the throne of our heart and the one that we worship, the one that we give all reverence, all praise, and, our, and all honor. But the reason I ask the question is, oftentimes, this isn't the case. There are other things that have taken that place. Now, all of you are thinking, well, I don't worship any false gods. I don't have any idols set up in my house. I don't have anything like that. But there are a lot of idols that have come into our lives that we don't even realize. Things that we have given our first attention. Things that we have given all the best of ourselves. Things that we can't live without, it seems like. So... It requires us to look and decide, what is it that I am worshiping? What is it that I am giving top priority? What is it that I love more than anything else? Hopefully the answer to that question is Jesus Christ. Hopefully that is who we are giving our worship and our attention to. And if it's not, if it's not, we, were to, we need to remove that thing from the position that belongs rightfully to Jesus. 87,000 people gather together each Saturday during the fall. Consecutive number of sellouts at this point are greater than 340. Thousands of people tune in to their radios and TVs to catch a glimpse. People talk about it online, call into radio programs and talk about it. They'll argue about it. They'll fight you about it if you disagree with their point of view. People wait for bated breath if there's a change in leadership that's going on. Merchandising is through the roof. You see people wearing their clothes everywhere. What's this amazing thing? I think most of you know it's Nebraska football. That's the thing, right? That's the thing people, that's something people are excited about. 
And it's kind of funny when you think about it, but it's something that people revere. And it's something that people take really, really seriously. People talk about its history. People talk about its legacy and all the people that have come and gone over the years. People know it backwards and forwards. People know who did what, who played what position. It's an important thing for a lot of people. But you know, ultimately, it's just a game played by young men who will come and who will go, and a new crop will come in. There'll be new coaches, new players, new things happen, and it changes all the time. It's something that doesn't really matter at the end of the day, who won and who lost. Whether it be a sports team, a music group, a politician, whatever it may be, if we give something our whole adoration, then it's misplaced. The Magi understood the one to whom all praise was due. They knew the one they needed to focus on. They knew the one that they needed to give their worship to. And it makes for a challenge for us. Do we give Jesus praise first? Or is it something else? What is it that we worship? What is it that we desire more than anything else? That's the question. Hopefully what we desire more than anything else is a relationship with Jesus Christ, one that's continuing to grow each and every day, one that we nurture and take care of because we love him, because we want him in our lives. There's a third lesson that we learn, a final lesson that we learn from the Magi, and that is found in the second part of verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2. It says, Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The third lesson that we learn is we must give him our treasures. We must give Jesus all the treasures of our life. The wise men came and were giving customary gifts for the future king. That's what you do. When you go and visit a baby, you bring them gifts. That was customary. But this was a future king, and so they lavished upon him these gifts. What were due for that exalted position? Some scholars, I thought this was really interesting, some scholars have seen the gifts as symbols for Christ's identity. And after I thought about it and looked at it, it made sense. Now, I don't know if this is correct or not, but there are many scholars that kind of ascribe to this idea. And that is gold, which is a gift for a king. So we give gold to kings, and so the gold represented the fact that Christ was a king. So that's the first thing. Incense, or frankincense, as it was sometimes called, was a strong-smelling gum obtained from the bark of certain trees, and that was a gift for deity. That was a gift that you would give to deity. So that was an important thing. So this acknowledges the fact that Christ was God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. So that gift represented Christ's deity. And myrrh was a valued spice and perfume, also from the trees, that was used for embalming, which was a gift for one that was going to die. And so that was a gift that you would give to someone that was, that was you were expecting to die. And so it was interesting that that gift was given to Jesus in light of the fact that he would later be crucified for our sins. Now, ultimately, we can't be sure of the reasons for each of the gifts that were mentioned in Scripture. We can't know that for sure. But we do know that they were valuable. We knew that they were precious. Even today, gold is a valuable commodity. It's something that's expensive. It's something that if you go to buy it, it will cost you something. It's a great gift to give. Frankincense. You might say, what is frankincense? Does it exist? I have a bottle right here. This little bottle of frankincense, which is like 0 .7, 0 0.17 fluid ounces in this bottle, this is over $80 in this bottle. And no, it's not mine. <laughs> I borrowed it. But it's over $80 for frankincense. This is an expensive gift that you would give someone. This is, has value and significance. Even in today's economy, this is an expensive thing. I don't spend $80 on much of anything. This is an expensive deal to have. And myrrh, that was also a very expensive gift. It's expensive. Now, you can still purchase that, too. And it also, it runs about the same price as the frankincense. It's very expensive for a very small amount. The wise men gave their treasures to Jesus, which should compel us to think, what am I giving to Jesus? Am I giving the best of my time, my talents, and my treasures to him? Am I giving my very best? Am I offering him the best that I have? 
When I wake up in the morning, am I giving my very best to Christ? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> it says, Do not store for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the question is, where are our treasures and where is our hearts? What is most important to us? We can tell by what we invest in. Hopefully our main investment is Christ and our relationship with him because Jesus is worthy of our very best. Jesus is worthy of our very best gifts. Jesus is worthy of the very best that we have. Most of you know that I spent, um, before I came here, I spent... um, nearly 12 years as a children's pastor. And before that, I spent another four and a half working with children and with students. And there was a lesson that I learned while I was serving as a children's pastor, and I discovered that the most generous individuals on the planet when it comes to giving to the Lord are kids. Far and away, they beat everybody every time. And I know this because on several occasions, I've seen kids that have no income They just get money for their birthdays or whatever anybody will cast off to them at the time. I've seen them give everything that they had. We'll have a missionary come. We'll have something going on. And they'll give every dime that they have for the Lord. And sometimes their parents are going, oh, man, are you sure you want to give all this? Are you going to be upset about it? Is this going to be a problem if you give it? This is all the money. You know this is all. Your birthday is not for another four months. You know you have no money if you give all this. And they're quick to give it all. And They don't think twice about it. It's fine. They're totally okay with it because they're giving their best to God and they love to do that. I believe kids have it figured out better than anyone else when it comes to sacrificially giving their best. Their hearts are open and they desire to share. The question for us grown-ups is, us big people is, how is our heart doing when it comes to giving to God? Are we so connected with him that we're giving him the best of ourselves the best of our time, the best of our talents, the best of our treasures. Are we giving those things to God? Are we keeping it or giving it to other places? What are we doing? Are we clinging to it or pouring it out because of our love for Jesus? That's the question. How are we doing that? How are we responding? We've come to our time of invitation, a time where we're going to be thinking about what Christ has done for us, where we're going to be thinking about what is it that Christ is doing in our lives, Is he continuing to work in our lives? Is he continuing to make a difference? We have to ask ourselves that question. Are we giving Jesus our attention? Are we giving him our worship? Are we giving him our treasures? And if we're not, if we're not giving him those things, and if we never have, then it's time to make a decision to do so. But maybe we've made that decision, and our priorities, like I talked about, have kind of gotten shifted and kind of out of whack. And maybe we need to come to the throne and say, God, I'm sorry, I've got things out of order. I've got things sort of confused. Can you help me write things and put them back as they should be? And maybe it's time for that. I'd love to pray with you about those things. We invite you to come as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Jesus paid it all.